So I'd now like to bring out the cast of Fear the Walking Dead. Please let me have a huge hand for Madison Clark, Kim Dickens! Strand himself, Pullman Domingo! As Alicia Clark, Alicia Devon Carey! As Jake Otto, Sam Underwood! As Troy, Daniel Sharman! Jeremiah Otto, Dayton Kelly! Ophelia Mercedes Mason! And as Walker, Michael Gray Eyes, rounding out the panel. Here he comes. And, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Nick Clark, Frank Delay! Frank's down here. Thanks, you guys. Thanks for being here. I, it's been really fun to watch you get comfortable with coming out in front of 7,000 people. I remember a, a few years ago when it happened, there was a little bit of a shell shock of like, oh my God, I can't. But this is, are you guys feeling more comfortable with it now? Is it, is it sort of feeling like part of the, part of the process for you? Well, well, we're more used to it, but it's, it's, it nev it's never not exciting and, and just like it gives you chills. Well, yeah, because you guys, you're shooting down in Mexico most of the time, and so you're sort of, you're isolated, and so you probably forget, oh, yeah, we're actually making a thing that people watch and appreciate watch and understand. It, yeah. We're in a yeah. bubble down there, and we come here, so it's really nice to see you all. So I had, I had predicted for a long time that Madison had some really uh, uh, effed up stuff in her past, <laughs> because she seemed so adept at being able to adapt to these tragic things, and nothing really seemed to phase her in any way. And then of course there's this big reveal uh, that she, you know, she had an abusive father and she killed him and, and she said she'd do it again. So what can you talk about in terms of where she's at at this point and then further like this k kind of being a figure for, for Nick and also to Troy at the same time. So where is she at at this point in the story? Well, you know that sequence where, with the, the reveal of Madison's past in, in this first half of the, of the season three was really satisfying for me. Like, I, I'd been suspicious, too. Like, I didn't know. Dave didn't really give me the details, but I'd been suspicious, and I kind of thought it was that that was what she had done uh, as a child. And I, I, I thought it was really beautiful the way it came about, like, the, with the fracture between Madison and her kids really challenging her on why she was doing what she was doing. And it was this beautiful moment where a parent becomes a human to, the, to her child. And... I just thought it was such a beautiful scene and a beautiful story, and, and I want to know more. I feel like there's more to know still. I, I was like, we don't really know how old Madison was. We don't know what happened to her after that. Did she go into juvenile detention or whatever? Is that what led her to be um, a high school counselor and to care for troubled youth? And, and does that give her this sort of window into you know, people with, with troubles and abuse issues and et cetera, and I think it did. I think a, a lot of times people will try to fix what they think is wrong with them, um, but this is a case for Madison where it's like the thing that was sort of wrong in her life is probably the thing that's gonna keep her alive and keep her family alive now. Right. Well, she's a natural leader She's like a natural she, born killer. She is. She is. But she. But she. But it's. She's a natural born person who does things that need to be done. Yeah. To, she's. It's ultimately from her childhood. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it was about surviving and protecting who she loved. How do you think a character like that? Because you know we see this in the Walking Dead universe a lot. And you're like, oh, maybe the you know the governor didn't start off as a villain. He started off as a guy. You know, Negan started off as a guy. Like these people. So how do you feel like a character like Madison? When, once you start doing these things that need to be done, how does it not just turn into bloodlust? And how do, how do you think she balances still, you know, having a soul and caring about people and not just killing for the sake of killing? Well, I think it is, it is a fine line. And I, and I think, you know, she does have to trade in brutality in order to, uh, as a means to an end. And the end being, like, we've talked about it before. It's like you're, it's the human instinct is to build a community again and come together and have a civilization and 
and I think Madison is, is transitioning from protecting her children and her family and who have become her extended family and, and now protecting uh, the ranch, the people at the ranch or, or you know, finding a truce and things like that. And I think that's how you know, a successful leader will transition with that the bad is, is only used when necessary for the greater good. Right. Uh, I think Strand has had a really fantastic arc in the last few seasons because he really could have just been a character that was just cool about everything all the time. That's how he was presented in the beginning. Yeah. And what we learn about him is that he's very complex. You know, he has this relationship to Thomas that he, I really do believe he loved Thomas and that it wasn't just all, even if it started opportunistically, I feel like he really did love Thomas in the end. And we've seen him vulnerable, we've seen him imprisoned, we've seen him lose essentially everything. So where, where is he at and what's he, what is he ready for at this point in the story? What's he going to do just out there alone as he... And, and then I say that and then you put on the sunglasses as the boat blows up <laughs> and you see the flames reflected in the glasses. You know what, um, we talked a lot about um, that last moment of Strand and when he's walking off and he has, um, you know, at, as he was, uh, the Abigail's in flames. And where he's going next. And we made a choice to give him a little glint and a smile. It's very slight, but to see that he's ready to rebuild again. That's something that's just in his nature. Um, he's been through uh, devastating circumstances probably since a child, and he's, re he's, he's built himself up. And so what we saw in season one was this well-made man of Western civilization. He was a bit of, a, of an enigma. And then it was deconstructed in season two. And now season three, it's, he's still being kicked, <laughs> taken the piss out of the entire time. But I think he's now uh, on the mend. And as you see in the, um, the teaser, um, I don't know. First of all, he's got a, a pretty big old beard now. And, uh, and he's now, um, he's grounded in a different way. And uh, things have a bit more meaning for him um, and weighted with a bit more of his heart and his soul. And I think that's something he was a bit more detached from uh, earlier uh, the way we've been presenting Mr. Strand. Well, yeah, so if, if you sort of operate from the assumption that people who cannot be trusted have a difficult time trusting other people. Yeah. Do you feel like that's something that he's learning how to do or going to have to learn how to do? Because you really can't... I you, think he's it's had very to difficult to be a lone wolf in this world. He's had to learn how to do it, and it wasn't easy for him. I think that's been a huge learning curve for him. Right. And I think the one that he trusts, trusts the most is uh, Madison. Right, uh, because knowing that she's not, she's one who she's fine with making the hard choices, and that's something that he was doing. And that's why they bumped heads, especially in season two. But they realized they were more alike than unalike. Right, uh, Frank Delane uh, had uh, I, I, watching Nick's what happened with him this season, and then a couple episodes ago, he's like, okay, well, I think I need to start learning how to shoot a gun and learning how to fit into this world. Uh, do you think he is becoming comfortable with what's going on now instead of kind of rejecting it? Uh, yeah, I think so. Uh, he certainly has a gun and a knife. Uh, <laughs> so I think so. I think, uh, I don't know. I mean, mm, uh, guns are uncomfortable things in general, I think. So I, I, I don't know how comfortable it is. I don't really know what Nick thinks. I have to clear that up. So I, I, I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. But know. there was definitely a transformation. Let me ask him. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> and you just push the hair down. Hello, I am yeah. Nick now. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll do inside the actor studio. I'd like to talk to Nick for a moment, please. Uh, but, it, but, there, but there definitely was a transformation with him. But it must feel nice because you, did, did you know some of the other English actors who came down on the set? Did you, did you, did you know these guys before they came down? I didn't know. We'd never met before. We, we, we don't really know, all know each other in England. There's, there's, <laughs> it's really, it's a myth. I don't it's understand. Really I don't believe that. I see you all turn up on Doctor Who and Downton Abbey, and I just like, oh, they all know each other. There's like 10 of them, and they all know each other. <laughs> and we're on an exchange program. We get them. They can do good southern accents. We bring them over. They can mumble. It's great. <laughs> but you, know, it's like, you, can, you can either do this, you can talk down like that. You know, it's like, it's fine. You're co-opting all of our superheroes, all of our make. It's fine. We're fine with it in America. We're very welcoming culture, mostly. Me and Daniel uh, were saying this, though. <laughs> We were saying, because we when we were filming, we were in the back of like this truck, and there were all these Indians going around, and we were dressed in like army gear and like guns. Proper American we army. Saying, no, I, we have no like contact. We have no like in route to this stuff. No. Like, it's just not in our culture. <laughs> right. Like, and these Native Americans running about and guns and like I have no idea what I'm doing. 
And there's just, there's just these, <laughs> these Englishmen in the back of like a Ford pickup going, yeah. what are we doing here then? <laughs> <laughs> this is a bit mental. I, I would say because Jake just stays at home reading, he's probably the most English out of... Uh, he out does, of, yes. Yeah. Yes, he has just had a spot of tea. Yeah. But, I do, but, it is, but it is always nice, I think, for people to, and I think it is a testament to your acting ability, because it happens a lot on Talking Dead, where the first time you come on, you know, and then you're like, yes, well, I've approached the character, and people are like, what? You know, like, it just, when Lenny James was on the first time, people were like, he's British? I'm like, yeah, and you never see Snatch? He's amazing. The guy's amazing. Here's why I don't think you, like, the Downton Abbey thing goes the uh, reverse, because when you do an English accent, it almost, almost goes always to, oh, well, hello. Yeah. And it's like, uh, well, I don't think that at all is a matter of fact. Accent is quite nice, actually. <laughs> I know this is all we. The, the only British I understand nice. is Monty Python. Right, right. So okay. that's it. That's yeah. where I get. There's like five accent there pulls go, from Monty Python. Oh, see the this guy or like, oh, hello, and this is Doubtfire. Uh, <laughs> one, one quick, fair thing. enough. Yeah. One quick thing I'd say about Frank this and Nick before we move on, because I think Frank has actually played this beautifully. I mean, you're. It's a very challenging position that Nick ends up in by the end of the season. And I think he has, he's definitely adapted and he's taken on aspects of the apocalypse that he didn't have before. But he's also in this strange position where he's getting close to things that are more violent than he's accustomed to. And one of those things is his mom, strangely. You know what I mean? So I think we get to a place by the end of the mid-season where he's actually now in some respects, you know, the, the torch has been passed. So it, it, it does, it sets... It sets you up in an interesting way for the back half, and I think it's and I just I think it's been really lovely how you've played him all season, well, th past seasons. I think it's also interesting to see as someone who's in recovery for alcohol addiction from the last 14, 15 years. It's really interesting to see a character whose addiction actually has his addiction and, and the world that he was living in before actually is weirdly a strength in this world because he's so used to the, just the darkness mm -hmm. and in the chaos. And that he, you know, he's he uses it as an asset because he becomes very comfortable in this kind of a world, which you know, it transitionally was, feels like was not that different to him for what he was going through. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Alicia had a, also had a big season uh, this year. Alicia with an eye uh, had had a big season this year. Uh, so there seems to be a lot of. Um, not animosity, but there's definitely friction with the fact that, and I think some of it is just because Alicia is such a capable, strong character yeah. that Madison not hasn't really ignored her, but definitely has put more of her attention into Nick because she's had to. Yeah. And Alicia has learned, I think, very much like her mother to be a survivor. So do you see her yeah, that way? Yeah, and to be just like independent and completely self-sufficient. She's had to be from a very young age. Um, but it's nice, I feel like we're finally seeing, especially with when the information of what happened to the Trimbles actually comes out, that it was Troy and that they covered for him. That's a real divider in that moment. I think it starts to question Alicia's relationship with how far that family bond has to go and cover up certain secrets, you know what I mean? Right. Like, like it, it, yeah, and like kind of what, like it's funny because Madison's all about family and it's, it's interesting to see how she's gathered another f extended family with the Ottos and kind of, she, Alicia's been with her and taking over the ranch to a certain extent or like going along with this. But once this happens, that's a real fracture. And I think it's nice to finally see then Alicia make up her mind of what's too far and what family actually means and what version of family is she really talking about. You know, that's kind of interesting as well, all of that. What do you think, how do you think she's viewing uh, what's going on with Jake? Like, what do you think she sees that as being? Everyone asks me this question. <laughs> the what's inquiring minds want to know. Status? Jake and Alicia, Alicia and Jake. Well, the reason that I ask um, is because no. it, it, does, it, doesn't just, it doesn't just feel like, oh, here's a female character and a male character, let's just get them together. Yeah, it I, feels like she was very much kind of using him as a distraction. Yes, no, I think it's actually really interesting. I got a lot of uh, comments on social media about, about it. A lot of people were annoyed that they had a young female character once again being rooted or standing next to another male boyfriend kind of character and yeah. I know you you and I talked a lot about it as well I'm having real trouble with like where to look with this <laughs> microphone I'm, like moving around <laughs> crazy um, but I think this is nice it's a nice moment to show that this is actually 
a, a young person trying to just be normal and, and fill in some of the gaps that were she missed out on through college and her youth and having to grow up too fast in this apocalypse. And it doesn't have to be about her falling in love with someone or her being with someone, but it is a natural part of life, wanting to have companionship and needing it beyond... Uh, um, um, what is it like romantically, romantically but also um, uh, where you're two people who are uh, codependent, codependent. Yeah. codependent. You know what I mean? It's yeah. it doesn't have to be that relationship, and I think that's what's nice about it is Alicia goes for it. It's her decision. She. It's a much more mature decision of I like this relationship we have but it doesn't have to ground my entire existence. It doesn't define you. It, it doesn't does define, not define you, but right. it also doesn't mean you don't have to have it. Right. right. Because in real life, people have all those relationships. Sure. And it, it, I think I know we're in a tricky sort of um, very political correct time where everything's very hard to define and you want to be able to define everything. Yeah. But I think it's nice that this relationship is a little kind of messy and confusing and doesn't really... Ambiguous. And it is yeah. ambiguous yeah. and that's okay. And it doesn't define Alicia. Um, also, like the show itself does such an amazing job yeah. of proving the point that women don't need men to survive. That is like a foundation of what the show, it, it's, it really is. So we, we, so we did talk a lot about it yeah. because if anything, I see Jake as being a character that is really trying to bolster up Alicia being a leader. Like I, I, that's what it is. It's not about a, the dependency that you talk yeah, about. But yeah, but it's also like two people honoring each other. Mm -hmm. And not like a whole. I mean, you're so right, by the way. Also, yeah. first of all, a huge hand for Cliff Curtis, uh, who portrayed <laughs> Travis. Yeah. But Madison almost like fractured her spine carrying him for two seasons around because he didn't want to do anything. <laughs> you know, like, no, I don't know. Maybe it's just like, shut up, stab that guy. We need information. Shut up, look pretty. But uh, Sam, how, how do you? Uh, how is Jake fitting into everything? And you know, he obviously is. He's, he's, uh, he's very intellectual and he's very academic and he feels like words can solve everything. I actually didn't trust his character at first because anyone, who's, anyone who speaks too articulately in the Walking Dead universe, I'm like, well, they're going to murder everyone. Like, that's what they're... Okay. This, is a, this, is a pre, this is a preliminary to a monologue. I'm, I'm still alive, so you, yes. you, you have to, like, yeah. But it does, it, does, it does seem like, at least from the information that I have, that he is a, that he is a good guy. How, how have you seen, <laughs> as an actor, how have you felt fitting into this pre-existing world? Well, I think that Jake represents... In my opinion, he represents uh, much in a similar way as Cliff's character as well um, uh, did in season one and two of being a moral compass, uh, believing that there is still good in humans. Again, I think that's very uh, relevant right now in the zeitgeist that's out there, is that there are people that still are idealists and, and optimis optimistic about the future of humanity. So when you put them in a zombie apocalypse, there are some people that still have that need to want to connect uh, a community through um, whether it's, you know, what the founding fathers did, a constitution or a democracy, but civilization needs to include civil, civility. And right. this is a world where there are no rules anymore. Um, the moral and ethical ambiguity that's out there is pretty strong. So Jake represents that need. And it's kind of interesting that he's one of the only people that truly is just dedicated to that. Violence is not his thing. Mm. Uh, and yeah, I mean, we'll see how that, you know, it turns out in general, but I think he's a, an important character as a reminder to the audience that, yeah, the world is pretty shit right now. Mm. And this, this world in the show is pretty shit right now, but there has to be that, um, that faith that things can still get better because otherwise it's just, you know, everything will crumble. So, yeah. and, and for Troy, uh, for Troy's character, he's, it definitely seems like he is more, uh, let's just run in and shoot things rather than talk to them. Yeah, I do, I do, I do but I think actually the, I think the, the writers this season have done a, a really beautiful job with all the characters and, and I think with Troy is no exception. I think what they've written is, Yes, of course, on the outset, there's a, there's a hot-headedness to Troy that I think, you know, obviously uh, allows for certain actions that, that seem very kind of morally reprehensible. But, like, what I, what I think they do a really beautiful job with is they, uh, they, make, um, they make him a, per, a human being, and therefore his actions and his things 
as we'll see later in this in the season as well, they they, they are based in a real uh, kind of a real understanding of he has of his own upbringing, of his own place, and and I I, I don't see I I never saw him as a hothead. I, I I think it's more important that he believes very clearly that this is this is about the survival of everybody here. What is happening between Troy and Madison? Because there are some times where it's like, oh, he needs a mom. Uh, it right. looks like he might be aroused. Like, it's, it feels like <laughs> there, he's definitely in right. this sort of gray area. And she, and again, this is, you know, just the brilliance and the strength of Madison Clark is she so understands how to push people's buttons. And she so understands. And she spotted Troy's weak spots immediately. Right. And basically... He was eating out of the palm of her hand after she tried to scoop his eyeball out with a right. spoon. Like, that's right. incredible. But I don't, but you see, like, I, I, don't, I don't think that's how, you know, for me, I don't, as to Troy, I, I think he loves playing this game. I think he's well aware that he's being played. I don't think there is this idea that, like, he does, he's blindsided by something. I think he's smarter than that. I think it's, it's smarter writing than that, which is he understands that he's still being played, but just the fact that he gets to play this game, he gets to play this chess game in which he gets to look like he has been fooled, is part of Troy loving Madison being there. You know, it's, it's, it may seem very one-sided, but Troy is as much, as, as much playing that game as she is, and I think she, he is enjoying the fact that she even thinks she has the upper hand. It's a, it's a very complex idea that I think they... You're right. That's an excellent, that is an excellent point. And I'm also jealous of your uh, beautiful windswept British hair. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just can't Not really. seem to do it. Yeah, it, uh, <laughs> it Dayton Cali. Two fans. Oh, what? Two fans at the same time. Just two fans it. at the it's same beautiful. time. It's just a beautiful just process. Uh, Dayton Cali, uh, who I was a huge fan of before for many things, particularly Deadwood, uh, but you've always, you've always popped up in things that I enjoy. And what are you going to miss the most about playing Jeremiah Otto? Wow. Uh, I guess being a loving, caring, understanding father <laughs> <laughs> will be the hardest part to let go. But, you know, I've, I've, I've just sat here quietly for the last 15 minutes <laughs> listening to these... Brits. And Australian. Talk really sophisticated and stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, and the uh, castaway. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, but you don't know what they do when they say cut. As soon as they say cut, they go, oh, this is fucking down here. They want to talk like this. It's the bloke. Can I see what he's saying? What he doing? Lug nuts. <laughs> you said that. You said they that. just go into their own little code, you know, that they have. But oh, yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing about us? What are you doing about us? Been, it's, it's been wonderful. <laughs> Listen, you had some stuff to get out. That's all right. We're a therapy group. You know, it's like we, this is share session. Everything's a safe zone. People. You don't know. I think it's funny. I think when you were on Talking Dead, I said, you know, what do you... What do you like most about Jeremiah Otto? And you go, the paycheck. I think that's what you said. As a no, joke. Uh, but it was wonderful to have you on this season, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you died. Uh, but it was a very important... You know, I teach the kid how to shoot a gun, and what does he do? Takes your head. Yeah, they got to take your head. He shoots you, and they got to they take your head. Uh, Mercedes did this really great runner on Talking Dead of Where's Ophelia, this sort of like the Bob Dylan-esque with the, the cards, like Where's Ophelia. It's the Love Actually. Yeah, oh, so Love Actually, yes, yeah. of course. Yeah, that's right. Uh, which was taken from Bob, Bob Dylan. Dylan. <laughs> uh, yeah, of course, of course, I knew that. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I would love to, because she seems... We, we've, see, we've had the, the luxury of being able to see these characters transform and their arcs, but when we see Ophelia, she's not the same Ophelia we saw when she disappeared before. So who is she, and who sh whose side do you think she's on, and what's, what's going on? Good Lord. Um, I mean, when we meet her, she's daddy's little girl with the braid to the side, and one of the things I wanted to do as we see her again when she thinks she's orphaned is sort of keep uh, a throwback but a more ballsy version of, of it. can I say that, ballsy? Um, well, you just said it twice, so I a guess. More, <laughs> a more hammer face version of Ophelia, where I wanted the double braids, I wanted to show that she's still who she is, but she's realized now, finally, that she is her father's daughter, and she uh, has to do certain things to survive. 
So uh, she's finally become a bit of a badass. Um, I can't wait for her to meet back up with Daniel Salazar so he can see what she's become. Uh, for them to go on a killing duo. <laughs> for them to go on a killing. Yes, Dayton. Tell him about our baby. Guys, I'm so sorry. He wasn't supposed to spoil that. Episode 13, Ophelia and Jeremiah Otto um, had a beautiful moment. A baby was born of it. <laughs> what? Um, he wasn't supposed to spoil it. I'm really sorry, you guys. Beautiful baby. Um, obviously now in my care because you're dead. So, <laughs> but looks just like you. And um, <laughs> <laughs> this is his daddy. Yeah. Um, so I'm really sorry about the spoiler, you guys, but now you know. So that magic telephone, they already got magic telephone, so it's already yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Autophilia baby. Uh, Michael Gray, uh, uh, Walker is such a great character, and this story is such an interesting story in this world. And, 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 and I don't, I mean, I guess technically, I don't even, I don't really see him as the, as a villain. I don't see this guy, I see this as a man who, this was, you know, this was his family's ancestral land. It was, to, you know, he's... Jeremiah is not the easiest person to deal with. So, but how has this storyline uh, been for you? And 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 uh, you know, certainly as a teacher, and and also things that the things that you're involved in. How how do you uh, pay respect to it in a way? And what's been exciting for you? I love playing Walker. I'm so excited to be on the show. Uh, I was a fan, a huge fan of of The Walking Dead and this show before I came on. So. Uh, when I had the chance to audition, you know, I, I first read, you know, the material they gave me. I said, "This guy's so smart." And then I found out as as I learned more about the role, he was a former lawyer. And so for me, um, as somebody who's really interested in in representation and and uh, understanding how media works in terms of our community, I was delighted to be able to play a character who was um, vigorous and uh, a leader. Mm. intelligent, articulate, mm. and brutal, and uh, uh, strategic. Because within two episodes, within you know, two sort of full episodes, he's kind of turned the entire um, uh, ranch inside out. Mm. And he ends up uh, you know, co-opting Madison, you know, this really strong character, into his plans. And they, and you know, at the end of, of Child of Wrath, you know, uh, Kim and I are on the ridge, and all of a sudden she's handing me a bag with, with Otto's head in it. So to me, you know, my mouth fell open when I, when I turned the page on that script, and I was like, like, this is one of the most fantastic characters I've ever had to play. My name is Kimberly. Um, uh, first of all, I want to just um, thank you all for giving us such strong female role models and uh, happy birthday to Alicia with the Y. Happy birthday to Alicia, had a birthday yesterday. It was yesterday, thank you so much, thank you. Happy birthday to you. 7,000 people, happy birthday to you. Harmonize, harmonize. Happy birthday, dear Alicia, Deb and Carrie. Singers. Well. Yeah. One more time! <laughs> uh, uh, what is your question? Um, will we or do we want to see an infected Travis and will we get to see what happened at the hotel? Wow. Which is wow. The... Inf will we get to see infected Travis? No. Okay. Uh, well, for, for a number of reasons. It was, it was never planned that way and also I think Cliff's now a little bit busy yeah. working with <laughs> Mr. Cameron yes. on the new Avatar film. So yes. I don't think we could get him back even if we wanted to. Um, so, and then what happened at the hotel? I mean, as far as maybe, I mean, I, I think we'll, we'll, it's going to be up to, I think, what comes going into season four if we ever go back to that, go back to that place and see what happened to, all, to Elena and company there. I always thought it was kind of clear because it was so just bloody and... And there was just... It, it didn't end well. It, it didn't end no, well. nothing I good know. happened there, but, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we, didn't get to, we didn't get to see how, how, they, how they survived or did not. 